All right. Hello, my name is Lonnie Douglas. I am a board member with the Eugene Springfield Solidarity Network. And I am Anne Fournier, and I'm here with the Solidarity Action Network, which is ESSN's partner organization. Yes, and we're here today with uh, City Councilor Emily Simple, Ward 1, uh, and we're going to uh, be doing an interview with her uh, for uh, the upcoming uh, Ward 1 race. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just want to be very clear, and, and we want to state that ESSN and SAN uh, do not endorse candidates, so this, these interviews are not an endorsement of any candidate. Uh, with the COVID outbreak, we simply wanted to afford uh, voters the opportunity to get to know uh, the candidates a little bit better since they can't go out and knock on doors and such. Uh, and we're hoping that this will help people to be more informed when they're actually voting. So uh, Emily, why don't we start off by giving you uh, some time to go ahead and uh, just introduce yourself and, and tell us uh, you know, uh, whatever you would like to tell us. Okay, ooh, that makes it kind of open. Um, first, thank you for doing this. It's been so frustrating uh, not being able to knock on doors and have house parties. And that was pretty much my whole strategy. I was took the pledge to not use very much money and then the virus. And so had to change that a little bit, but trying not to be too extravagant. So I'm Emily Semple. Eugene City Council President. I represent Ward 1. I'm running for re-election and I hope you will support me so I continue doing good work for all of us. This is my fourth year on council. I've learned a lot, but it does take, you know, a year or so to, to feel comfortable to really, well, a lot of people say we don't get a lot done and we don't get it fast enough. And you're right but um, you still need time to get even as fast as we are. And um, part of that is because you've got eight people with different opinions we don't meet very often and we don't really get to talk about things enough. There's too much time between those meetings. But anyway, I know what's going on. I've studied the issues a lot. So I have a, a good database, a good knowledge base, made connections with the community and with staff. I have a great relationship, which is, really handy when I need information. Um, I have the momentum. I enjoy this job. I have a lot of enthusiasm and I, I really care about our community. This isn't about me or my goals or aspirations of political life. I love Eugene. I've been here 35 years, raised my kids here, been involved in all kinds of things from Oregon Country Fair to the Junior League and um, lots of other activities. And this is a real help for me because um, I'm approachable because it's pretty easy for me to connect with a wide variety of people because I've done a whole lot of different things in my life. Um, and I used to think, God, oh, I'm so scattered. What's this all about? But in this job, it all comes together. And uh, it's been, been really good. I represent Ward 1 well. It's a fairly diverse uh, ward as you go from the, the flats up to, to City View and College Hill, um, the income changes, the yards get bigger. So I, my goal is to listen to all the sides and get the information and the opinions um, and, and be as fair and equitable with solutions that are sustainable and doable and uh, actually make a difference. Um, I'm on the Sustainability Committee, the Human Rights Committee. I've been on the National League of Cities Human Development uh, Committee, of course, budget, and a bunch of other uh, climate sustainability, uh, climate action committees. Um, that's pretty much me. I'm open, I'm approachable, I'm working for you, I'm responsive, and uh, even when people don't like my decisions, they do appreciate that that I think about it, you know, who wins and who pays. Okay. Keep that clear. So um, I think that's probably enough of an intro. Cool. All right. Thank you very much for that and for letting voters know a little bit about who you are and your background. So our first question is about the unhoused crisis in Eugene because it doesn't take a crystal ball to see that the current recession is going to exacerbate Eugene's affordable housing crisis. 
and force yet more of our residents onto the streets. So how are you going to respond to the immediate spike in homelessness and housing instability, but also what measures are you gonna take over the next few years if reelected to uh, help Eugene's unhoused over the longer term? When I started um, in Occupy, first we were about the 1%, which I know you're gonna to get to. But as homeless people came to the camp and we fed them and let them sleep and listened to them, we saw huge changes. So um, that's what the biggest motivator was for me to go to council was to come and uh, testify about how we needed to help our homeless. And it's been just agonizingly slow or progress. Yes, we are housing uh, people at rest stops and dust to dawn and car camping, but it's so small and it's been so slow and it's so frustrating for you and for me. The virus has given us a real kick in the butt to get things uh, going faster. We can't wait for everyone to be happy about it. Um, we need immediate, safe places for people to shelter that aren't in a great big room where we're breathing each other's air. Um, I think that the camps up out, Amazon and Hilliard with only 10 people, I hear they're getting great community from 10 feet away and that helps them to stay there. But that needs to be spread around um, because that's how we live, is spread around. And why, why should unsheltered people be in these? Um, it's an opportunity to think outside the box because the things that we had lined up, they're not going to be enough. Um, and as this situation changes, we have this opportunity to learn and see what's working, what we should keep, what we should change, what we should get rid of. Um, I want a lot of the TAC report implemented, but we need more than that. The Navigation Center, everybody have a central way to um, get into services is really important. But we need to keep people housed. And yes, we're gonna have an increase in, in homelessness and that's really distressing. So we need to find money. Most of the things you're gonna ask me about require money. Um, and so we need to be savvy and see what the federal government and state, county uh, grants, private um, contributions. It's like we keep saying, it's gonna take all of us. And this, um, within our pandemic crisis, is its own crisis, one that we had before. Um, I want to see job training and day work so people can get experience. And obviously we need job development so people can get work. Uh, let's put some housing on those major transit corridors. Transit will be cheaper for those people and uh, it makes more sense to build density right there. So more density usually means cheaper. And we need to be um, humane, human, respectful, taking care of each other. I, I am so distressed for so long and, and want this change. Everyone should be able to take a shower and wear clean clothes and wash their hands and have a toilet, laundry. And it, it affects us. It affects how we interact. And, uh, that hurts people. So uh, I said, let's have everybody have accessible hygiene facilities and see what happens in 30 days. I like to have that. But uh, we need to do more, we need to do now, and we need to do bigger, and we need to find money. And uh, if we can't, we need to figure out what we're willing to not have because um, it's a human right to sleep in shelter. And, I will continue to work for that. All right, thank you. Um, do you want to take the next one, Lonnie? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to, uh, the, the question we sent you was pretty generic, but I'm going to, since you are on the city council, I'm going to tweak uh, the way I word it a little bit. So uh, last June, the city council voted to implement a payroll tax in Eugene. They also decided and voted not to refer that tax to the voters. Um, uh, and you were one of the, the counselors who, who voted to not refer it to the voters. 
Uh, we've been asking people what their stance is on payroll taxes and whether it, they agree with the decision of the council not to, to, to refer it. I figure that's kind of a moot point since it was your vote. So what I'd actually like is for you to maybe give us uh, uh, some of the reasons, you know, why, uh, you know, one, why did you uh, vote to, uh, you know, implement this tax, uh, but also, uh, and even more importantly, I think, why did you vote to not allow voters to, to, to actually have a say in the tax or to vote on the tax? I've been waiting for this question. I know um, that if you were endorsing, you probably wouldn't endorse me because of my vote on this. But I'd like to give you um, some of my thought process about it. Um, and just I'll start out right with this. Um, your feelings are strong. I'm so glad that you care and you're aware and um, get it on the ballot. Let's see what happens. Um, so, you know, I will tell you what I was thinking. When I first got on council and I live downtown, so we have a lot of challenges downtown. And a lot of them, I think and thought were due to meth addiction and we need more treatment, but we also need less meth. Um, and being a newbie, I made an appointment to see Chief Kearns and went over there for an hour and uh, pretty much covered the meth problem in about six minutes when he said we don't have enough detectives on drugs working on uh, drug problems. And I said, well, then we need to get some more. And this surprised everybody, including myself. Um, why would an activist be wanting more police? But uh, not only is, is the public safety downtown really needed some help, but even though I am downtown's counselor, the whole city is really my ward. And the police were not able to respond to 30% of the calls. So I didn't want more police to go round up people sleeping. I wanted people all over the city to feel safe. So um, my advocacy for some more police officers um, grew and grew to include a lot of things that we also need. Our 911 operators burning out, working overtime. It shouldn't even be working full time for such a stressful um, job. Uh, it's not a huge proportion, and I think we can shift how much between the different topics, but there is some for youth outreach and, and homeless and um, the courts. So these are things some people really want and some things people don't. I think in the long term, the, the good things will be good and the things people don't want will also make Eugene a safer place for everyone and, and happier. So that's how came about why more public safety. And then I was on this public safety team to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And pretty much we had a big notebook of all the different ways we could uh, make taxes and we looked at them and almost all of them couldn't raise near that kind of money at all. And it would have had to be a patchwork of an enormous number of taxes. So they were all regressive, but we didn't want to put it on a utility bill, the same for everyone. And this one at least had some um, scaling. I absolutely agree with Betty that we should have made it nothing for which we did for minimum wage, but then once you get up to 15, which isn't very far from minimum wage, you start paying it. And um, her idea of, of $25 or, or 20 would have been much more equitable. I voted for that, the rest of council did not. Um, so we got a little movement, not enough. And uh, then it came to council, did we wanna do this? And you know why we didn't put it on the ballot. We didn't put it on the ballot because we didn't think it would pass. And if it didn't pass and people still wanted us to do these improvements from public safety, we'd have to take it out of our savings account, which we really need for other things, especially right now with financial and housing problems. So um, nobody likes taxes, but we felt we needed to do this. And um, I knew that it would be unpopular. I knew it was a risk for, for my job, but I truly do believe that in the long run, it is, 
is the best route. And I truly do believe in you protesting it. it it's, it's right on. That's how we do things in Oregon. Um, so if you want to change it, get it on the ballot. I don't know what we do about missing the, the deadline with the virus. It's messed everything up in all kinds of ways. And if it does get on the ballot and the tax is overcome and fails, I have two questions. Do you want improved public safety? And if you do, how should we pay for it? And I think you'll want me to tax all the rich people and well, actually, have that much power. So that was the end of my notes. What else do you want to know? So I would say two things. One, Obviously, uh, we generally don't answer questions from the candidates because we're here. Oh, I wasn't expecting you to. But, okay. but, but what I will it was say. rhetorical. Well, right. But I, there just a couple of things to say is, um, one, ESSN isn't taking, an, a, a, or SAN is not taking a stance on whether, uh, whether we should or shouldn't have a payroll tax. I we're understand taking, that. Yes. We're taking a stance on the fact that we, we believe that the voters should um, be able to vote on the payroll tax. Uh, the other thing I was going to bring up is when you said that we wouldn't endorse you because of it. If we were to do endorsements, which we won't, I know we, that we would look at more than just one thing that you did. And, and I would encourage voters to always look at all of the candidates at all of the things that they do, because um, the one thing that they did that you liked or the one thing that they did you didn't like, that could, uh, th that, that's not the whole picture. So we do encourage people. And that's why we want to ask you all of more and questions. I really appreciate that. And um, I guess I was being a little bit flip about it. And I, I know you're about a lot more than that. And I to understand that you're not coming at it because you think the tax itself is or isn't workable. You are upset because we didn't give you the chance to decide. Right. And um, I respect that. Right. Uh, just one little thing is my job is to listen, get information, get your opinions, be your representative, but it's also my job to be a leader. And sometimes I made this decision and I will say it is the hardest decision I made. And um, what happens? Okay, good. Excellent. Oops. I lost track of time. I forgot to start. Oh, uh -oh. But I feel like <laughs> I feel like that was a constructive decision. And I mean, there are constructive discussion, and there are there are a lot of issues facing Eugene. And I know Dan has uh, taken a public stance on this one, but I know for all of our board members. Speaking for me, that predates me a little bit, and there are a, lot, a wide range of issues that are very important to us. Um, which brings me to our next question, which is affordable housing, which is another critical issue. Um, because Eugene has one of the worst affordable housing shortages in the country. So what approach should the city take to resolving our housing crisis? And we're just leaving this very open-ended so that you can lay out your basic methodology and what steps you would want to take, continue taking. Thank you. And I just want to say, I really appreciate all the work you do on so many different subjects. I didn't mean to put so much emphasis on that one. The worst affordable housing in the country, um, and we're not graduating from high school and it's not looking good, Eugene. How to be fair, you know, this is, this is a problem. And, you know, how do we get people who have plenty of shelter and money to help us get housing for, for all of us? Um, you know, it comes down to money. Where are we going to get it? How are we going to shift it? How are we going to make it possible to build affordable housing and still keep the builders here? So when I look at different methods, I, I do try to find the fair part. So like the CET, some people didn't want it at all. Some people wanted it to be higher. Um, I picked the middle one. Because I'm, I'm always asking if we're going to change SDCs and we're going to do uh, subsidizing or incentivizing, you know, how does it work out? How, how do we pay for the things that we give up? Um, and we'll see how 2001 works out. That'll be some changes that, that will um, 
we'll see. But obviously we need more density and that usually means more affordable housing. We need to build more affordable housing. And again, we need to keep people housed in their affordable housing because if you knock it down and build new housing, it just has to cost more than the old housing did. I'm leery of the cookie cutter approach because our wards and our neighborhoods are different. Um, we need density, but we are individuals also. I, I'd like to see us really promote the density in the building along the mass transit corridors with uh, different density zoning uh, help closer to the corridors because then we could reduce our transportation uh, pollution. Um, we, um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, um, so zoning, permits, SDCs, it's complicated. And I just want to say, okay, let's, let's build and, and the ADU thing. And, and it, that one took us just embarrassingly forever to get, to get through. And, uh, to the point that even I was going, come on, come on, come on, let's just make a decision because everything is going to get challenged. So let's at least get a, a start going. And um, I'm not against ADUs. You know, I am for neighborhoods. So I think we'll be careful. I think with the virus, things are going to shift in all kinds of ways. And um, oh, my favorite thing to not like, Mukti. Um, that's certainly supposed to make more housing, but I think it robs everybody of taxes that should be spread around and not just in the special multi areas. Um, it, it takes money from our taxes. And like you say, the rich people are getting a break. Do they necessarily really not be able to build this and make a profit without the multi? I don't vote for it. I don't think they're fair. And um, I don't vote for urban renewal either for the same reason. I think um, we need to be investing in more parts of our town and not just downtown. Downtown does belong to everyone, but everyone doesn't live in downtown. And we're gonna build on the mass transit corridors. Well, let's have what we used to call nodes at the end of them also get some incentivizing um, for more housing. Um, so many ideas we need more I know. there's so much i um well we have that next one i just wanted to ask a quick follow-up question because we have we are talking to several people in your race and you mentioned that you're not against adus but for neighborhoods and it seems like um or at least what some people in the community are talking about like on letters to the editor etc is differences between you and your opponents on the question of upzoning. And so I was wondering if you would like some, take some time to elaborate on that and how you feel about um, like uniformly increasing density within neighborhoods themselves or solely developing on transit corridors. Not necessarily as a, as a binary, but that concept. Right, right, it shouldn't just be there. Um, one thing that I realized, um, makes me think about it maybe a little differently is I live smack in the middle of downtown and we have a ton of infill. So when I think of, oh, more ADUs, more infill, uh, it just, it feels kind of weird because I live down where there are those bungalows with little, with little yards. And we certainly do need to build up in the city drastically. Downtown needs to have people, um, people there. And so other parts of town aren't as dense as where I am now. So I, I have to realize that they have more room for this infill. And of course, whoever owns the property gets to decide what to build on there. Um, and so it can, I think the opportunity to build um, is good. And I also know people, people don't like change. And it's like, well, this is my neighborhood. I got it the way I like it things are going to have to change. But I would like to also have areas where, I don't know the right way to do it, but some people do want to have yards. And um, it would be nice if we could accommodate that in the city also. Um, can I answer yeah. 
that off on a little. Mm -hmm. well, that's okay. It's just about getting what your opinions on those issues out there so that people can watch oh, it and, right. and understand. It, it does bring up the issue though of, and I guess this is a follow-up too, which, which, uh, but um, when we're talking about um, the types of housing, little homes, ADUs, things like that, um, you know, we're talking about these as homes for generally for the poor and the poor working class um, because people with money aren't going to live in an ADU necessarily. Or how do we keep these, how do we ensure that this does not become the new standard for working class housing? Uh, and how do we ensure that uh, people who are living in an ADU in somebody's backyard um, are not creating a whole new class of landlords. And some of them, I mean, you know, there's some people that will take advantage of that and stuff. So how do we protect people uh, from that? From being taken advantage of? Yeah, like, like I say, or from just ADUs and tiny homes becoming the new standard for our working class uh, people, an, an entire new category of housing. You know, if, if it costs $900 to rent a, a, a 15 by 15 ADU, it's no longer affordable housing. Doesn't right. help the homeless. Right. Um, I would like everyone to have options. And I'm not, not quite sure how to make everything affordable. Um, and no, not everybody does want to live in a tiny house or an ADU. Um, I really like the cottage clusters. Um, I think they're kind of cool. So we need, you know, all the sizes, you know, the missing middle isn't just about sizes, it's about affordability. So I would like to, to like you say, not everybody wants to live in those tiny houses. So how do we keep it affordable that people can have a choice of, of their habitation? Um, because you're right. I don't. I don't want that. Oh, if you don't make enough money, you have to live in a in a small box. So that's something to think about, and I appreciate you bringing it up. I I wish I had a better answer. Okay, thank you. Is it my turn to ask a question? I think so. <laughs> uh, I think we are on number four. So uh, uh, again, the need to incentivize of. Uh, of to incentivize affordable housing uh, development can place landowners and developers, affordable housing activists, I hate that word, low-income housing uh, activists, because those are the ones I like, yeah. and labor groups at odds. How will you manage the conflict between that 1%, the developers and the people who are making money off of this, and the rest of the community? So this looks like question number five, just to make sure I'm answering the right thing. This one is, maybe it's five, no, I think this Yeah, is we had to change, we were trying, we rewrote the question slightly from the email to the interview, because this has all happened on the fly and we were trying to make them shorter okay. so you'd have more time to speak. Shorter. I hope that's all right. No, it's fine. It's just like I was trying to, are we going back to vision? Should I just put them together? Yeah. Oh shoot, that the order got swapped. Yes, let's go. We can we had vision for after this, which can kind of double as your closing statement if that works uh structure wise. Yeah. Okay. I'll do I'll do I'll do five first. Yes. Yeah. If it this is so this is about how to balance demands yes. between the different segments of our society. Yeah. And uh Occupy called to me and that was all about the 1%. And like I said, we sort of were forced to move into more homeless advocacy, but the unequal <coughs> distribution of money and opportunity in this country is, I don't wanna say all the bad words that I'm thinking about it. I, I don't know how much as a city councilor I can affect the distribution of wealth uh, worldwide or city citywide. I, Think that the richer people should pay more taxes and uh, how this unequitable you know they get to make the money and we don't I need to be Solomon or somebody really really smart and wise to figure this out um, 
They oppose the Mukti and the urban renewal as incentives for rich people to be richer. They rob the regular people. A lot of what I already said, we, we need to invest in more parts of the city. Um, so it's, you know, the, the and little things, the riverfront development, they've had to change the plans a little bit when they found out they were going to have to pay prevailing wage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were some rich people and some worker people that got it moved a little bit. So I, I agree, this is a huge problem. And um, I think about it, I, I do what I can, and I don't know how much I'm really going to be effective on city. So I don't want to mislead you as to my powers. Um, you know, yeah. I think I think a really good, maybe a good follow up for that one is I think what we're talking about is less about um, taking money, the, the, the wealth inequality and more having to do more with the wealthy have seem to have more access right. um, to our elected officials, whereas working okay. class people uh, you know, because they're busy working and such, they're not able to take and go and have lunch with uh, with, oh, with yeah. you know, city councilors or to go down and 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 meet them downtown and 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 you know take the time. So I think what we're really talking about is that access. You know, the wealthy developers, by the very nature of their wealth, have far more access to our elected officials than the average working class person does. And um, how, would you, how would you manage that? Because as a city councilor, that is something you could have ideas on, on how to change or to manage. You're absolutely right. And I noticed that, especially at forums, if there's a hot topic coming up, um, the chamber and other connected people with networks and computers, um, they can get, 40 people there with the same colored t-shirts uh, from the morning to the evening and those of us that work more jobs and have uh, just a lot of things to take care of on on very little money we don't have the time to to come to forum and find child care and so it is it is really skewed i mean everyone can write an email but that doesn't have the give and take and I'm willing to meet with people in the evenings or the weekends if that's the time that they can do it. Uh, but but I'm a really accessible counselor, and so that's that's not possible for everybody. We've talked about actually going to the different high schools once or twice a year so that we could have our forums there now, and and it would be closer for different people instead of just um, downtown. But with the virus, that's that's not very good. I am hoping, though, that the, the opportunity of these Zoom meetings, which are great, but that they're kind of weird, would at least give us a way for people to communicate with us in a video because you get the body language and uh, nonverbal verbal communication. I think that our outreach, even though we're doing uh, surveys and open houses, is not enough. People don't know what councils talking about and i forget when i'm talking to people that they don't know all the things i know not that i'm being snobby about it it's just that's what i spend my day doing and they know more about things i don't know but that's a disadvantage i'm i'm not trying to get a job doing those things um i have unfortunately been locked out of facebook for nine months so i can't communicate with people that way but social media does get to some people, but not everybody has a computer. Not everybody reads the newspaper. So um, a lot of diversity in how to, to reach people is, is gonna be important. Because like you say, the government is, is for all of us. And we do notice that uh, the Southern wards are more active, but they're not more important. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, so I think in the interest of time, we should probably roll up your closing statement and our last question into one, which kind of works given their structure. But we'd just like to ask you what your vision for the city is, and should you be reelected as an elected representative, what role you will play in bringing that vision to reality? 
when I get my magic wand out and my crystal ball will have all of this solved. Um, of course, my vision is, is for prosperity and shelter and, and happiness and culture, mental and physical and financial health. It's a big job. Um, but this is my goal. Let's make Eugene the place where happiness succeeds. Oh, I mean the pursuit. I can't guarantee happiness. Let's make Eugene the place where the pursuit of happiness succeeds for each person and all people. So my vision is that we don't have to have a human rights commission anymore because we all have human rights, because we see each other as equal and we provide the same opportunities to each other. It shouldn't be that, you know, well, Bethel's got the best schools, but we should have equality with the, the different opportunities that we have for all of our residents. You know, clean air, clean water, sustainable jobs, renewable energy, green space, these are vital things. These aren't just, oh yeah, if we can afford them or find the time. This is how we need to, to run our lives. I will continue to look for those balanced solutions. They're really hard and somebody's always gonna be unhappy. But I listen, I think, and my role is to continue to ask those questions, get the answers, listen to my colleagues, Take advantage of our opportunity to talk to each other and appreciate the, the ideas we bring up. You know, if we were always had consensus, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. We wouldn't be talking about things in depth. So we'll be housed, we'll be employed, well-educated, healthy, and pursuing our happiness. And I want to help with that. So um, I'm looking for your support. Please remember to vote, vote for me. The choice is simple. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Duane, you want to close things off? Yep, yep. No, thank you again for coming. Uh, again, to remind people that these interviews are not endorsements of any candidate. Um, they're simply a, an opportunity for you to get to learn a little bit more about them. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for uh, participating. Uh, we appreciate it. I'm sure the voters are. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to, to hear you talk and learn a little bit more. Um, and, uh, you know, good luck, uh, good luck with your race. Thank you. I, I, I like this job. I think it's been good for me and I think it's been good for you, Jean. Uh, uh, and I do so appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate your questions cool. because sometimes they're uncomfortable. I got that stuff out there and I hope you'll post a link. Yes, we will. We'll notify you and get you the stuff. All right. You have a nice day. Okay. You too. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Cool.